It is probably a truth universally accepted that the best camera to make your film or video project with is the one you already own. It would also probably be a safe assumption to make that you already own a smartphone. And if you own a smartphone, you already have the biggest part of the puzzle in your pocket. Even a lower end smartphone will be a more powerful computer than those used to edit small scale film and video projects only a few years ago. It will also have a camera that will be able to film full HD. It might be able to match the quality of a professional level cine camera, but that's not the point. And the quality will be more than good enough. If you're creating video content for online and social media, then in some instances, a smartphone is likely the best tool for the job. That shouldn't limit your ambitions. Artists and directors from Steven Soderbergh, Zack Snyder, Charlotte Proger and Park Jan-wook, to name just a few, have all made shorts and full-length feature films using their smartphones as their principal, if not their only camera. For example, on Netflix right now, Steven Soderbergh's High Flying Bird was shot entirely on an iPhone 8. So don't let the belief that this is an inferior tool diminish your ambition. The most important thing when using a smartphone for filmmaking is how we control the camera itself. Your smartphone will have a built-in app for the camera. This will have various modes. Typically, this will be used in an automatic mode where the camera decides all of the exposure and white balance settings for you. This is useful for working quickly or when you're trying to document a live moment, but for video and filmmaking, it's usually not the best option. When working on a more crafted project, we need to have full control of the exposure settings our camera is using. Using the camera in a full manual mode gives us control over the ISO, shutter speed, focus, and the white balance. This is important because when we use the auto mode, the camera will often make the wrong decision for us, choosing to set the exposure for a window in the background rather than the subject in the foreground, for example, or changing that exposure as things move around the frame whilst we're filming. Increasing or decreasing the overall brightness of a shot over time, thus creating a clip that is unusable in an edit. This problem is not unique to smartphones, but is true of all cameras when used in a full auto mode. Hence the importance of full manual exposure control. Now this will differ from phone to phone, but it's usually labeled something along the lines of pro mode. Once you've found the pro mode, the exposure triangle of the shutter speed, ISO and aperture works in the exact same way as it does with any other DSLR or mirrorless camera. The only difference is that most smartphones have a fixed aperture for the lens. What this means in practice is that we are simply selecting an ISO and balancing that shutter speed against it to create a good exposure. Essentially, we're simplifying the whole process by reducing the number of variables. Creating a correct exposure, one where the image is not too dark and underexposed or not too bright and overexposed, will depend on the light available for you and your subject. As you will only be working with the ISO and shutter speed, the process is a fairly simple one, but one we want to make sure we get right. Now we start with the ISO controls. The ISO controls how sensitive to light the camera is. The more sensitive it is, the less light it needs to create a correct exposure, and vice versa. The higher the ISO number, 3200 for example, the more sensitive to light the camera will be thus allowing you to work in increasingly low light situations. The lower this number is, 200 for example, the less sensitive light the camera will be and the more brightly lit your subject needs to be. ISO also affects another characteristic of our image, one that we refer to as noise. Noise is random variation in the color and brightness of any given pixel making up your image. The higher the ISO, the more noise will be present in your image. Noise is random and changes each time a camera makes an image, which for video is upwards of 24 times a second. This means the noise will change dozens of times a second, resulting in poor quality video that looks a bit like a poorly tuned TV signal and footage that will ultimately be unusable in the edit. Now, there will be a point where shooting above a certain ISO will have so much noise that it makes the footage unusable. This will be different from camera to camera and phone to phone, so really crucially, shoot some test footage of the same subject at a variety of ISO settings, from low to high. Then assess that footage. Once you've identified that tipping point for your phone, don't shoot any video above that ISO. Setting your ISO is going to be a judgment call based on how bright the scene is. You will assess how much light is available. Is it outside, is it inside, is it sunny or cloudy? 
then set an ISO that is appropriate for your subject and scenario. A bright sunny day outside can be set as low as 100 for example, but for an interior it may need to be as high as 1600. Just remember to try and use as low an ISO as you can to ensure the best quality footage from your camera. The crucial thing to remember is that once you have set your ISO, you do not change this until you finish filming all of that scene. The noise level is going to be different for every ISO setting. So if you film part of your scene at 400 and the reverse angles at 1600, then in the edit, the noise level will appear and disappear from shot to shot. The footage will have the feeling of being shot from two different cameras with varying quality and ultimately be quite distracting to the viewer, making parts of the scene potentially unusable. So the golden rule is, once your ISO is selected, that is locked in until you're finished filming that scene or subject. This is true of all cameras and not just smartphones. Now shutter speed is how long the camera lets light fall into the camera sensor to make one image. It's measured in fractions of seconds, so 1 60th of a second, 125th of a second, 1 1000th of a second for example. This scale is also universal across all cameras, but some cameras or smartphones extend higher or lower on that scale. All cameras have the key part of that range. The duration of time the camera sensor samples light falling into it is crucial for creating a well exposed image. The shorter the time a camera sensor reads the light, the darker the image is going to be. Conversely, the longer the sensor reads the light, the brighter the image will be. We also refer to fast or slow shutter speeds, with longer shutter speeds being described as slow and quicker shutter speeds described as fast. The shutter speed we require to create a well exposed image will also depend on the ISO setting used and the amount of light illuminating our scene or subject. Now just as ISO affects the noise within our image, shutter speed also affects one of the characteristics of our shot, that is motion blur. Motion blur is a softening of the image that affects only things that move within our shot. Static elements are unaffected by motion blur and will remain sharp and in focus no matter what happens. For example, a person running across your shot could be affected by motion blur. The background, however, will remain perfectly sharp and in focus. Motion blur, however, can occur when the camera moves, not just your subject. In this case, the subject can remain static or relatively still, but a moving camera will result in the entire frame being blurred. The amount of motion blur a shot will have is directly affected by the shutter speed. The camera sensor creates a single frame of video by sampling the light falling on it for a set period of time. If things change during that time, then there's going to be blur around the thing that changed. The slower the shutter speed, the longer the camera uses to make one frame of video, and the more change can occur during that time used to record that single frame. Therefore, the slower the shutter speed, the more motion blur will be present in the image. And the faster the shutter speed, the less motion blur will be visible. If we shoot at a high enough shutter speed, we can in fact record an image with no visible motion blur at all. Motion blur, however, is not a bad thing. It's simply a characteristic of our footage and a softening of the image is actually something many filmmakers look for when describing a cinematic feel to their footage. The visible light we are able to see exists within a broad spectrum. We measure the light within this range using colour temperature, degrees Kelvin. This is not related to how hot the light makes you feel, but rather how warm or cool the light is. The range extending from warm golden light, which is typically 2700 Kelvin to 3000 Kelvin, through to cool white 5000 7000 Kelvin at the other end of that spectrum. The camera sensor is also sensitive to the same range of visible light. But a single light source does not emit light that covers the full range of visible light. Different light sources exist in different parts of that spectrum. What this means in practice is that we need to manually set the white balance, telling the camera to match the light source you're filming under. Your camera's white balance calibrates the colour in your image to the light illuminating your scene, and this is crucial for accurate colour. All cameras have a series of presets built in for different white balance settings. This means we as videographers and photographers don't have to remember where candlelight sits on that scale. All we need to ensure is that like all the other camera settings is that we take white balance into our control and out of auto and we manually select a setting based on the situation and the light we are filming under. 
For example, if you're filming under halogen light bulbs, if you have the white balance set to a sunny sky, then the colour will be inaccurate. Taking on an orange hue. If you set the camera for a tungsten bulb, but take it under a blue sky, then your image is going to have a really heavy blue hue. So always stop and assess and change your white balance if you move from one situation to another, taking into account any changing in the lighting. As with ISO, the key is to set your white balance based on a judgement call at the beginning of filming a certain scene or subject and to not change this unless the light circumstances themselves dramatically change. If you move location, indoors, outdoors for example, always ensure you assess the light situation and set that white balance appropriately. But why not simply leave it on auto? Because again, the camera will assess the white balance for every shot and can even change it whilst filming. So if a window takes up a portion of the frame, it may change the setting mid-shot and change the colours of your clip, making that shot again unusable in your edit. Now some smartphones, normally ones that are lower in the product range, don't have full manual control in the Pro mode. They give partial control of your settings with manual ISO and white balance, but the shutter speed is still controlled by the camera. Typically this is accompanied by some form of exposure compensation control. But this exposure compensation only allows us to raise or lower the exposure, brightening or darkening our frame. This is not only fine when we have an exposure lock function within the Pro mode, but this isn't always there. The exposure lock allows us to set our exposure and then lock it, so it won't change whilst we're filming. This gives us enough options to have both creative control and consistency of our exposure whilst we're filming. However, sometimes we're looking for more controls or options for our smartphone camera. Perhaps we're looking for additional features such as a histogram to help with exposure peaking. That is where third-party camera apps come in. Apps such as Filmic Pro, ProShot or Open Camera, amongst many others, bring additional controls and features to your smartphone camera. The video apps such as Filmic Pro in particular have been used to film entire feature-length movies. As the additional control it offers increases the usability and therefore the quality of the footage produced by your smartphone. Most apps will offer full manual control of ISO and shutter speed, but check compatibility before purchasing any app, because not all apps have listed features available in every model and phone. Typically, lower tier models don't allow access to certain app features or controls, either because the phone lacks the processing power, or more commonly, the phone's operating system has those features locked. So as always, Check your manufacturer and model compatibility with any app you're planning on using before making any purchases. Smartphones have fixed lenses. They have a fixed focal length, how zoomed in or zoomed out they are. This affects how we can visualise the world with them, as we only have one tool to create all our shots with. Normally when working with a dedicated camera such as a HDSLR or a mirrorless camera, we have a range of lenses to work with. And using the correct lens for the job at hand gives us more options. Cinematographers use specific lenses to help craft the visual and style and language of a film project, something we can be limited in doing when working with smartphones. That being said, you can do an awful lot of the lens within your phone as it is. However, if you're wanting to create images beyond what the stock lens can achieve, or you're wanting to break away from your footage being recognisably shot on a smartphone, then additional lenses might be a useful tool. Typically these are small affordable lenses that clip over your smartphone's camera, converting what is a fairly wide angle to a much more zoomed in telephoto or specialist lens such as an anamorphic or even a macro. They can be really inexpensive with a set of five coming anywhere from under £30 all the way up to 200 for top tier glass. However, some current smartphones now have a range of focal lengths built in. If this is the case with yours, experiment with the different focal lengths your phone has before making any purchasing decisions. You 100% do not need additional lenses, but sometimes the additional tools help us to achieve the footage our project needs. As always, the most important thing is just to practice. Get your phone out there, shoot some footage, put it in an edit, and start to see what works and what doesn't. As always, thanks for watching, and we'll see you in the next one.